Barbara J. Simon, author of the book Singing Body and Soul, a medley of fresh ideas about musical theater. The book has been endorsed by Stephen Flaherty, the Tony-winning composer of Ragtime. And today I'm talking to Rabbi Saul Solomon on Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Sing! Sing a song, sing out loud like an angry Jewish person, sing out strong, don't worry if it's not good enough for anyone to hear. Well, you really should worry, it should be at least good enough, otherwise people go around holding their ears and vomiting. So, how do you sing a little better? How do you be confident in singing no matter what kind of voice you have? I love to sing, I want to learn more about singing, and so, on this episode of the Dave's Gone By radio program of the air, I am very excited to be talking to an expert in singing and song and songstressing. She is the author of the book Singing Body and Soul, which is published by iUniverse Books, and it's also got a, a wonderful recommendation from a major theater person. She'll tell you about that. But please welcome Barbara J. Simon to the neighborhood, talking with me, Rabbi Sal. Shalom, Barbara. Hello. How are you, Rabbi? Thank God. Well, you know, I have, I have issues. Uh, my hip's not uh, doing too well, and the prostate, of course. But uh, how's your prostate? Is it good? Uh, last time I checked. Good. This is important. It's important to have a good prostate when you're singing. Yeah. Yes, that's true. You're when that tightens up, it empty. constricts everything. It's very bad. Yes. Do you like to sing? Oh, I love to sing. I love to sing in Hebrew, in Yiddish, uh, Cantonese occasionally. Mm-hmm. If you saw my uh, my stage show a couple of years ago, Shalom Dammit, an evening with Rabbi Sal Solomon, I sing a bunch of songs in that, and only a few people uh, threw fruit. So I was I was you know. Now, I thought they would throw vegetables, but it was fruit, so I knew they didn't hate it that much. I was I was gladdened by that. So let me ask you an important question, Barbara J. Simon, who is very scarily silent at the moment. Are you Jewish? No, I'm not. Oh, God damn it! Why not? My first boyfriend was Jewish. Does that count? Oh, oh, so you were Jewish by insertion. At least briefly. <laughs> Sorry about that. But okay, but uh, so you were raised, what, what were you raised? Methodist. Oh, so are you still? Do you practice? I do. Do you, do you have the method down, as it were? Uh, well, you never really get it completely down, but you keep trying. And yes, I do. Well, what is, what is it about Methodists that separate them from other kinds of Christianity, from Baptists, from Protestants? What, what, is, what is it about you folks? Well, we're Protestants, so, so it's separated from Catholics. Um, but there are a lot of different Protestant sects. And one of the things that I like about Methodists is that they're sort of easygoing. And they're, uh, you know, it's sort of open-minded and middle of the road, and there's a lot of them out there. It's not a small group of people. Anywhere you go, you can find a church that seems familiar. Um, and, yeah. and so much friendlier than the Lutherans. Oh, boy, they'll turn away from you, won't they? <laughs> Just teasing. Just teasing. So, so okay, well, uh, and, and do you go to church every week or every couple of weeks or uh, what? I go, I go every week now. Yes. Really? I do, yes. Huh. What does it do for you? I'm wondering. Um, well, one thing is that it puts me in a community of people that um, I can share things with that are different than my other groups of friends or my professional colleagues or my neighbors. It's just a different kind of vibe, uh, and I like it very much. It's, it's peaceful, it's fun-loving, it's pleasant. Oh, it's sure not Judaism, then. <laughs> Holy crap. Certainly not Judaism. Very, very different there. But speaking of loving fun... Music is fun. Music is delightful and joyous. So tell us, how long uh, have you, uh, did you start out as a singer? Uh, you know, I, I asked to take piano lessons when I was in kindergarten. And at my first recital, I asked whether or not I could sing the song while I was playing it. And I, I remember it was green sleeves, and I must have been about six or seven. And I sang so quietly that no one could hear me. But it was really important to me that I sing and play at the same time. And I've been doing it ever since. Fortunately, my voice has gotten a little better since then. Oh, mazel neglik. That's wonderful. So did you pursue it in high school and university? Yes, I did. In high school, I was in uh, all-state chorus uh, for two years. And I did a lot of children's theater. And I was one of the leads in the high school musical. And then mm, went on to... Not, not high school musical... Uh, the Disney thing, but what was your high school musical? Cabaret. Cap- oh, my God. Whoa. Were you one of the Kit Kat girls, or were you Sally Bowles? I was Fraulein Schneider. Whoa. Thank you very 
much. Yes, yes. <laughs> great role. What a great role that is. Absolutely. Yes. Did you sing So What, or did they cut that uh, from that no, version? I sang it. But I'll tell you what, um, I'm actually a soprano, and usually that part is given to an alto because the songs are so low. And uh, I knew I couldn't sing it where it was written, but I wanted this part so badly. And they knew I was a character actor. They knew I would work on the accent and that I would, you know, play a 60-year-old woman convincingly on stage. And they really didn't care what happened to my voice as a result. So oh. I sang the auditions in the lower registers where it's sung. Lada Lenya played the role originally. Yeah. And about three weeks into the rehearsal process, I told the orchestra conductor, you know, I can sing this entire score an octave above where it's written. Would you like me to do that? Because I think that'll be easier for everyone. And that's what I did. I sang the whole thing up an octave. Um, and it worked. And what was it? Was it so, went, so who cares? So what? <laughs> you basically did it like that. Yes. All right. No. Oh, no, wow. it, no, it was it was lovely. It was it was a pretty soprano part. Now moving towards college, mm -hmm. did you were you still involved in musical theater? I went to NYU Tisch School of the Arts as a musical theater. Major. Oh my God! Oh my God! The the producer of this radio program of the air, Dave Lefkowitz, he too is a Tisch School of the Art graduate. Well, there you go. Amazingly, it wasn't musical theater. It was uh, it was film and uh, radio and TV and all that kind of crap. But mm -hmm. I did a lot of student films there as well. A couple of them ended up on HBO. It was great. Whoa! Well, no, nothing Dave ever did uh, ended up on HBO. <laughs> <laughs> He's lucky some of it didn't end up on CNN, let me tell you. But, all right, so so what, um, what theater did you do in, in college, though? Uh, well, I was in the musical theater department for two years, um, and so we didn't actually have uh, any productions for the freshmen and the sophomores. And then I transferred into the Gallatin Division, which is an independent study program, which allowed me to continue to take courses in Tisch, but also to take courses through the rest of the university, because I, was, I sort of had a broader, um, like more of an intellectual academic approach to what I was doing. So I was taking the physics of sound and playwriting and the roots of religion and courses that I felt would help me that were not available in Tisch. And, and that's been a wonderful thing. I really, I really have been on that same track ever since. And my book is almost like a dissertation based on what I actually studied at Gallatin. Uh, but it was all an extension of the musical theater program at Tisch, which was great. Well, be careful. Don't, don't use the word uh, dissertation because people might be scared off and think it's a, a heavily researched or academic book that you can't read sentence to sentence. And it's no. very, very f reader friendly stuff about singing. Well, the reason I wrote it the way that I did it, you're right, it's, it's funny and the sentences are short and there's not a lot of vocabulary in it, um, but it's because the singing voice sort of gets activated when you hit puberty around 10 or 11 years old, and it shifts and keeps changing and moving all the way until you're 25. There's actually still um, changes in your brain at 25 that have not quite settled in yet. And uh, th so I needed to write a book that could be understood by 10, 11, and 12-year-olds because... By the time you're 20, that's when you really need to sort of hit the ground running as a singer. That's when you're at the, the height of the, 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 the heat in your voice, you know, the, the passion in your voice when you're at the height of your fertility. That's actually when the voice is at its hottest, and that's when you're most likely to get a recording contract or get into a Broadway musical. So you need about 10 years of experience of singing and performing on stage before the age of 20. So that puts us back down to the age of 10. So... I'm sort of explaining physics and neurology to 10-year-olds, so it is darn well better be Give funny. Vault. Well, you Well, like, one of the first things you're starting in the book is that uh, it has to do with the two parts of your brain. Right. So tell us a little, uh, please, about this. Well, uh, you know, the brain is divided into two different hemispheres, and the logical side of the brain, which is the left side, um, is also the side that contains most of the language. And the right side of the brain, which is more artistic, is um, the side that the, the singing process sort of happens in, in more often. And when you get in the wrong half of your brain, you're, you're, you can lose the lyrics, you know, and you, can, you need to have both sides working at the same time. The example I use in the book is of the, uh, on Harry Potter, when he has that lightning bolt down the center of his head. Yeah. You actually need to have access to both halves of the hemisphere very rapidly while you're singing. You need to sort of be able to zip back and forth between the two different focuses to get everything to come together. Um, and when you do that, it really does seem like what you're doing is magic. It's a perfect image for a wizard and huh. a perfect image for a singer. 
Huh. So, is that, but you, you, you can't tell a 10 year old or even a 50 year old, okay, harness both lobes of your brain. It either happens or it doesn't. How you, you can't make someone do that. Well, I can keep them from getting trapped in one half and ignore the other half. And that's usually where the problem is. Um, if somebody's concentrating on the lyrics and then they sort of stop listening to what's happening or they stop processing what they're, what they're getting in their ear, then you can get off pitch. Or if you get really emotional about a song, suddenly the lyrics fly out of your head. It's those moments when you're in one side, when you're supposed to be sort of balanced between the two. And, and with a little experience, you really can teach someone how, how important that is to do. And, and there's one other chapter in here that I, I found interesting because if I'm singing with a lot of music around or there, there, in a choir, let's say, with other people, mm -hmm. it's very hard for me to, to do anything unless I keep one ear closed. If I, if I put one finger in my ear, I can sort of, uh, I still hear myself a little bit. How do you tell actors or singers to do, to sing on key, on pitch, when it isn't just them in a room? Well, Usually I tell them to concentrate on the sensations in their throat. Huh. Um, when, when you can feel the inside of your throat with as much detail as you can feel with your fingertips... That's what I told my wife on my wedding night, but you know, just kidding. <laughs> then, then your brain is better trained to let your voice do what it's meant to do. If you're focusing all your attention on your ears, you're going to get sidetracked. Huh. If I say more, sing, if you're having trouble, I would put your fingers on your larynx. Um, really? Rather than covering one ear. I mean, if covering one ear works for you, that's fine. Everybody's a little different. But I would put your fingers on your larynx. And that would actually tell you whether you're just slightly off or on pitch? Um, it's not a matter of telling you. It's a matter of focusing your brain in the place where the action is happening. Huh. If you can focus your brain where the motion is happening, where your larynx is, then suddenly everything will come clear. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're talking clearly with Barbara J. Simon, the author of the book Singing, Body, and Soul. So you did this stuff in college, you came out of the Gallatin division of NYU, and then, like everybody else who comes out of the arts field, you're 97% unemployed. What'd you do? Well, I, um, I taught singing lessons, for one. Actually, I had, um, I had already started teaching while I was at NYU in the little rehearsal rooms. People had heard me sing, and they'd, they've heard me... Um, using my voice as an actor as well and I was in a dance company at the time at NYU and uh, it was a children's theater dance company and so a lot of the dancers in it had never done children's theater but they were really good dancers and I was probably the weakest dancer in the bunch but I had been um, talking on stage much more than they had and so we had to introduce the dances to the kids and I was often the one who was asked to do the longer introductions, the introductions that were more complicated. We had one call and response song we needed to teach the audience, and I was always the one to do that. And finally, the directors of the dance company came to me and said, would you teach a couple of workshops to the rest of the dancers to show them how to do what you're doing? Because we don't know what you're doing. All we know is that it's working. Ah. And from there, I ended up with my first three students, and I was still living in the dorms and teaching in the in the rehearsal rooms at NYU. So from that point on, I've always had students in the evenings and weekends. And I worked in a couple of school systems here in Hoboken, and I, I directed musicals for them. Oh, nice. And, uh... Well, can I, well, right, going back, though, first of all, have any of your students uh, gone on, if not to fame, then to some Broadway roles or, or some notoriety? They have. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I always say that I teach musical theater. And all of my students work on musical theater songs because it's such a strong foundation. But um, I've had the amazing experience of having so many of my students take this training and go off into another genre. So I have a student who's um, like an Americana singer who has, has a blues band who's releasing his first singer-songwriter CD next weekend. Oh, my mazel. And uh, I have a student who sang an R&B song on the Oprah Winfrey show, and she's had a long career of doing house music. Um, and I have... Uh, a an a cappella singer who's doing a concert tomorrow night with his um, college a cappella group, and he's won several national awards as an a cappella singer. Um, so and I have a, a rock singer who's put out his third CD with his rock band, and they you know they tour around, but but none of them have been on Broadway. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because they seem like very very different kinds of singing. A, a, right. a rock and roll voice is well, I mean. It, 
theater is changing for the past 10 years, but right. generally, you're not going to find a rock and roll voice doing a show like Cabaret. They might do Hamilton, but they're not going to do, right. uh, you know, Mr. President, or they're not going to go into Oklahoma. So how do you, how do you balance those halves of a, a kind of singing voice? That's such a great question. Thank you. Because it's not about the sound. I am not teaching them how to sound. I'm teaching them how their own larynx works and then to take their personality and the things that move them and their heart and the music that makes them, you know, jump up in the air, that's what they should be singing. They shouldn't be singing what I sing. I'm a coloratura, believe me. They don't want to be singing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but actors, musical theater actors, don't have a choice. They might. Uh, but musical theater is so varied, and, and they, can, um, they can, you know, go after parts that are appropriate for their personality and what they sound like. They don't have to sound like everybody. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to be a mimic to work in musical theater. You can have a certain style that works for you, and then maybe you need a layer of an accent on top of it, or, you know, but, or, a different, or you're in a, a show that has a different genre of music that you're singing, but, but you're not going to morph your voice around somebody else and their opinion of who you should be. That's the, that's the whole point of the whole thing. You're not supposed to do that. You need to be who you are and then find out what the voice of that person is and then go in that direction. So you're saying it is possible, let's say, for a heavy metal kind of singer to, to do a little night music? No. No, I'm just saying that it's possible for somebody who does a little night music to teach someone to do heavy metal music. Huh. Okay. There's, there's a whole layer of understanding of the, how the voice works that's underneath the sound. The sound is secondary. Well, what are, what are things like a, any singer or any person who does a lot of talking, <laughs> uh, <laughs> present company included, uh, should do to protect their voice and save their voice? Well, uh, you need to know your voice really well, and you, you need to know whether or not you're getting hoarse. Um, and if you, if you have allergies and if the temperature has changed or suddenly the air is very dry, you need to be very tuned in to your voice to know, okay, today I'm not going to talk unless I have to. Today I'm going to make sure that I have, um, you know, some, some ginger candies. I use these ginger, ginger candies that are individually wrapped, and I've always got some with me in my purse. Why ginger? Strangers, yes. No, but, but why ginger and not, say, Marianne? I don't know. I don't know. I like the red hair. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but no, I was to, um, when I was rehearsing for the show that I was doing a couple of years ago uh, off Broadway, um, I was warned that menthol was an enemy. You figure cough drops, oh, menthol, Hall's Brothers, Luton Brothers, they got the nice Jewish beards, but no, no menthol you stay away from, right? You know, I've actually never heard that, but it doesn't surprise me that, you know, some things, some things work for one kind of a problem and then a problem with your voice is a different kind of problem. You need a different medicine just because it's sort of in the same general area in your body. doesn't mean that the same cure-all works for everything. You oh. can also drink throat coat tea. Does that work? It really does, oh. and I don't know why. Hmm. <laughs> I've had this explained to me several times, and it still doesn't make any sense to me, but boy, does it work. It's great. Now, speaking of great, you know, uh, I guess you're friends with or certainly acquaintances with one of the more important musical theater writers of our time, a fellow who was involved in the, with his writing partner, Ling Ahrens, Once on this Island, and they did Ragtime, and they did, did a couple of other shows. I'm talking about Stephen Flaherty. How do you know this person? Well, you know, um, when I was at NYU, um, the... The head of our musical theater department was Grover Dale, who was a choreographer and director on Broadway. And he sent us all off campus to his wife's voice teacher. And this is the man that I dedicated my book to, Joseph Scott. Um, and at the time that I was studying with him, he had three singers who had Tony nominations all within one year. Wow. One, one was Grover's wife, Anita Morris. Uh, and the other two, and the other was uh, Karen Akers, and then oh my gosh, Daryl in um, Dream uh, Dream Girls. And I went to this class every week, and so did a lot of people from NYU. We all ride the train uptown to the Ansonia Hotel together. And Steve Flaherty was one of the accompanists in the class, and we just hit it off. You know, we were just we just became friends, and we've been friends ever since. And then, and then so you keep in touch. And what is he working on now, by the way? Well, I'm not really supposed to say oh. anything. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So, 
But do you ever? I, I always ask this kind of a question because I'm so uh, self-centered. But you know, he's done all these musicals and, and workshops and things of these shows that he's written with Ling Aaron's. Do you ever say like, "Hey, you know, uh, Stephen, you could cast me once in a while"? No, I wouldn't do. You that. you would feel wrong about that. I I just don't think it's appropriate, and I I wouldn't trade on my friendship with him for that. Oh hell, I'd trade on my friendship for anything. Oh, he was so kind to endorse this book, and I just. And, you know, this is actually the second edition of it. Um, oh. The first one wasn't as geared towards younger singers. Um, I had sort of a lot of the same information and the same seven chapters, but it wasn't quite as well thought out as this version is. And, you know, he read the first version and he endorsed it. And then when I did the second one, I called him and I said, would you like to see the new version and, and see if, you know, I, I've changed some things. I took some sections out. There's some new things in. There's some new songs in there. You know, you're welcome to take a look at this one before you put your name on it. And he said, no, go ahead. Nice. Name on it. So he trusted me. Very nice. Well, and, and, and you put in that whole uh, post Fifty Shades of Grey sexual section, which I find absolutely fascinating with diagrams and everything. <laughs> and then scratch and sniff. It's, it's kind of horrifying. By, uh, and he still has his name on it. So God bless him for that. We're talking with Barbara J. Simon, the author of Singing Body and Soul. One of the pitches that you have for this book wasn't geared towards 10 year olds or 12 year olds, but for, uh, for like Valentine's Day. If yes. you want to serenade your sweetie, male or female, you're saying it doesn't matter that you have a lousy voice? Well, it's not that I want you to sing badly to your honey. I, I want you to maintain that relationship because yeah. that's important. Um, but what I'm saying is that there are many elements of a song that you can use without actually singing the pitches and still create the same environment of a love song. Are well, you talking about Sprech singing or like Rex Harrison or what? Well, yeah, Rex Harrison is, is one of the people who, uh, who's very good at this, where he speaks the lyrics in time to the music, and his voice is so glorious. I mean, you could just listen to him all day. Um, but but if he has the, the feeling behind it that you would want in a singer, but he can do it just as an actor. So you can actually speak the words of a love song in a way that is very passionate, as if it were a love poem. Hmm. Um, and you can you can do that in a variety of different ways. You know, you can go on to YouTube and get a karaoke version of the song and just have the music underneath you as you're speaking on top of the music. So it's sort of like a, a poetry um, recital, you know. Where I, you, I get it. Yeah, that's you know, nice. So you, so you get the spirit of the love song in there without you actually having to match the pitches. Um, you could also use a song that has like a Latin beat to it that's got a really lively rhythm. And if you're good with rhythms, like if you're a drummer, you can um, clap out the rhythms to it as you're saying the lyrics. And, you know, pretty soon you're probably going to burst into the melody anyway because you're going to get so close to it you just can't resist it. But uh, there are lots of ways to interact with the music besides just singing it. I, I may try. I may try that uh, with with my missus tonight. It's it's uh, you know it's Saturday. It's our sex night. I might uh, try to warm her up, get her excited a little bit. You know, like oh baby, I'm gonna stop you tonight. Oh bend over, I'm gonna stop you tonight. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do the hand claps. I think that really it'll distract from the singing. I think that could work. Well, it's also fun too. I mean, there's something about it that's just sort of playful and humorous and humble. And you know, you can get. Get your honey to join in with you and and start dancing around the room. I mean, it just opens the door for letting you embody the music without feeling stilted because you think you're not going to sing it perfectly. Now, were you going to give a, a, a demonstration of that, or did you have something else you wanted to uh, to kind of demonstrate? Well, um, I actually brought a a song that's in the public domain, so that I was sure that I wouldn't get you all in trouble if I said this on the air. Um, but you could do this with, you know, any kind of a song. Was it Habana Gila? Um, no, that's that's not a love song, is it? Or am um, I mistaken? Is that a love song? It's a happy song. I, I love it. So I guess it is a love song for me. But no, what song did you bring? <laughs> well, I just got um, the old favorite of um, the light by the light of the silvery moon. Oh, yes. Which has sort of romantic lyrics to it. So I'll just say them and see if you think that this is, uh, if this would motivate you to start um, kissing someone. Oh, okay. <laughs> By the light of the silvery moon. Well, I have an erection. There I, we go. I wanted We're the done. moon. For my honey, I'll croon love's tune. Honeymoon, keep a shining in June. You silvery beams will bring love's dreams. We'll be cuddling soon. By the silvery moon. 
All right, that, that's very sexy. That was very, very sweet and said, yeah, of course, I'd be all over you in, in, in a second. After the third word, I would have been on top of you. So. so you can do a lot with songs by really getting inside them and thinking about, you know, how you want to embody them. You don't have to do it the way everybody else does it, and you can really be playful and have fun and just open yourself up to trying new things. But, but to be fair, what you just did was recite poetry. You did not sing. That's true. I didn't. So... You, is that what you're basically recommending, though? People who don't, who can't carry a tune. Can, can you teach anyone to carry a tune, or do you just tell them to do the Rex Harrison thing? Um, that's an interesting question. I've never had it phrased to me that way. Sort of both. Um, there are a few people who really do have some, like, audio processing problems in their head, and they, the way they hear things and they reproduce them is, is just a little out of step with the way most people experience it. Um, and that can be difficult. It's, sometimes it's hard to get over that. Um, but it's so unusual. I mean, very few people have that problem. Um, I have gotten people to sing on pitch that other voice teachers have given up on. Hmm. Um, from the larynx thing, from touching the throat, or a different way? No, that's, that's part of it. Sometimes um, I ask people to think of a cone going around their throat and down their spine, and that they want to put the, the vowels down that spine, uh, down the cone of it, all the way down. And that moves the larynx. That image um, moves the larynx in a position that's sort of back and lower than it normally is. And surprisingly enough, that that does remarkable things. Most people's larynx sit a little a little too high for the best singing position. And once you get the muscles around the larynx to move it back and down a little bit, then suddenly people can feel the pitches where they couldn't feel them before. Whoa. And then it's more pleasant. And then because it's more pleasant, they sort of pursue that route. And then you're okay. Is that also sort of the difference between what they call head voice and chest voice, or is that something else? That's something else. Okay. Would you like me to explain that? Yeah, in, in, in layman's terms, or laywoman's terms. Okay. Um, the vocal cords have, um, there's, there's two sets of vocal cords in your throat that are very close to each other. One is called the true vocal cords, and they, they have a little ridge um, of like white, almost cartilage material on the edge that come together and they touch, and that's you know, every, whenever you're making a sound, those chords are touching. Um, but there's another flap of skin that's above that, that when you become a teenager and the hormones start moving, those, that flap of skin gets engaged in the process, and it starts to move too, and there's a, a sense of it having more weight to it because they're a little thicker, um, and that's, that's just the nature of them to, to sound, you know, deeper. So... There's actually a physical difference in the throat between whether you're just using the main... Um, the main vocal cord or his partner? Right, or, or whether you're using the, the additional set as well. Hmm. Huh. Okay. I never, I've never, i never heard... Thank you for explaining that. Let me ask you... Of it. There's a picture of it in my book. Oh, well, I haven't gotten that far in the book. I apologize. Okay. I see the skeleton picture there. Uh, there's a couple... Not that many drawings in the book, but... No, um, the one right before the skeleton. Show right before the skeleton. The vocal cords from the back. Now, let me ask you about different kinds of voices. Why is it that we consider, and it's his centenary in just a week or two, uh, it, it would have been Frank Sinatra's 100th, 100th birthday. What is it about his voice? And, and you talk about the voice being at its prime at between 20 and 25 or 30, but his voice really didn't hit its prime until his 40s, we, most people think. So what was it about him? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, part of it has to do with the shape of the vocal cords. It's just like if you look at a dancer or a gymnast, people's bodies are just to have different proportions to them. And it has to do with the actual shape that you're born with. And he was just born with just the right shape of his vocal cords. And he used them very well. He used them very skillfully. But it also had to do with his thinking and the way he approached a song and his understanding of the song and how he could get his emotions into the flesh of the chords. And, you know, that's what I always say is that singing is a, is a matter of spirit entering into flesh. And that's a magical thing. It's amazing. And it's part of what we live for as humans. And he had that one down. He really knew how to make the feeling and the emotion of the song a part of the actual process of the chords moving, and and it's gorgeous. <laughs> because, you know, you, there are also many, many wonderful singers. You've got Perry Como, and you've got the wonderful Tony Bennett, who is still performing, and yet there's something about Frank 
I know. I know there is something about him. Um, it's amazing. It's it's amazing that he uh, and he also was such a good actor. I mean, he he wasn't he wasn't a singer uh, as just a singer. Hmm. Um, not that that's just, but um, he had he had uh, an understanding of the storylines that he was in, and that's what I always lean on in musical theater is that musical theater songs are written to move the plot forward. And so you, your character starts in one place in their own understanding of the story, and during the course of the song, they come to a different understanding, usually. And by the end of the song, they have made a decision, or they've let go of something, or they've, they've decided to take a new road in life at the end of the song. And so it's so storytelling-oriented. And he had that down. And a lot of the songs he covered were from musicals. Sure. Um, well, that was the, the Tin Pang Alley back then, in the, okay. the 40s, 50s, 60s, up until... You know, the theater changed, and then the pop charts changed. Can I ask you, what is your favorite musical theater song? Um, I Remember Sky by Sondheim. From, that's... Uh, Primrose. Um, in, Evening Primrose. That was, well, that doesn't count as theater. That was TV. But, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> bet you thought I never heard of that song, too. I'll bet you. But, uh, okay, and what about, what is your favorite popular music non-theater song? You know, at the moment, I like Rihanna's Stay very much. Hmm. Now, that's one I haven't heard of. Shows you how old I am, let me tell you. <laughs> and now, is that your favorite song to listen to or to sing? That's my favorite song to give students at the moment, because so many people are able to connect to that song so quickly, and they move up to another level by working on that song with almost no help from me. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> song just does it, and I just say, that was it. Remember what you just did there. That was it. Um, so it just makes the teaching very, very easy. But I, I also perform that song as well. I really like it. Um, and well, I actually mentioned performing. I, you're, you are a teacher, and you've written this book, but where and when do you actually perform? Do you still do theater? Do you record? What do you do? Um, well, I sing it... Uh, I mean, I've sung in church. I've done the offertories in churches, and I've done... Um, oh, you crazy Methodists. I yes. know, I know. Uh, and uh, there's, a, you know, there's an open mic at Hoboken every month that I go to, and um, there was a... You know, this has been Sinatra's centennial year, and I live in Hoboken, so you can imagine how big a deal that is. Uh -huh. um, and we had a, a, a centennial celebration at the Elks Club here last spring, and I sang a three-song set there. Um, you know, in an evening gown and the whole bit. It was nice. Nice. Did, did it ever occur to you, or, or did you ever at some point think, huh, maybe I want to do the cabaret nightclub circuit and do the Karen Akers thing, the Andrea Marcovici thing, the, or did that not pan out in some way? Well, I did that with Steve Flaherty. He was the music director of my cabaret act. Mm. And, um, and I did a couple of them. Um, but I actually find that I like teaching better. Um, I like the variety of teaching. I like dealing with all the different kinds of people and all the different sorts of um, issues and problems and, and desires that they have for singing. Um, and I like the. I also play the piano, so I I like the fact that I, I play and I sing and I and I teach uh, and it's all such a a synergistic experience. Um, I like the intellectual side of it a lot. Um, and I, I get a lot of ideas. Um, I actually had some aptitude tests done when I was a teenager, and um, one of the things they said to me was that, you know, musical theater is a really good place for you to go because it, it brings so many different kinds of disciplines together, and you would really thrive in an environment like that. But they said, don't think that you're going to have a career on Broadway for 30 years because that's not going to happen. And I said, why? And they said, well, you should go try to get maybe one or two shows under your belt just as a credit, but... They said, you get so many ideas so quickly that you're going to want to keep changing the show. You know, you're going to get <laughs> four months apart, and you're just going to decide that that jam step shouldn't go that way. It should go this way because you like it better. And it's going to be almost impossible for you to do the same thing eight shows a week for six months. You're just not capable of it. You're going to start changing things, and the director's going to want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so you should work in an environment where the show keeps changing. You know, so they said you would be a really good professor of musical theater at a college where you do, you know, with, where you're working with students who are intending to go to Broadway, where you're working on that high level, but where you have your hand in everything and you can talk to the conductor and you can talk to the lighting director, you can talk to the costumer, you can talk to the choreographer, 
and you can get them all coming together in, in your vision. They said in Broadway it's harder to do that. The unions sort of keep people farther apart. Well, sure. Um, and they said you, you're going to want to be a little more hands-on than that, and you're going to want to have things changing faster in front of you. You just want to move on to the next thing so fast. And you, you mentioned that you, uh, you direct occasionally, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, per I sort of, well, I, I've directed some shows in Hoboken when I was in my 20s, but I, I sort of don't want to direct a whole show anymore because it's it's too hard. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But I do find that um, when I'm working with a student who's in a show, uh, I will be very careful to tell the student where to draw the line between me advising them as a voice, co voice coach, and then I can move into the area of directing the number that they're doing. And I'd say, look, this is not my place, this is the director's job, but if they like what we did, then they're going to be grateful because we took one more thing off their list they don't have to worry about. Hmm. If they want to change it, by all means, you know, do what they said, don't do what I said. But nine times out of ten, the director just takes whatever I did and puts it in the show. And that's enough for me. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have been very, very happy talking with Barbara J. Simon, the author of the book Singing, Body and Soul. It's put out by iUniverse Books. You can find out more both at iUniverse.com and also at her website, bjsimon.com, bjsimon.com. So, last question for you. If, you. if you could boil down, like, the most important thing in the book, or, or about singing and music in general, what would it be? That you need to sing from your heart, and that that's more important than the sound, and that if you do that, it can lead the sound to getting better. Um, and that's a good thing, but... But you really need to sing what you feel and what you mean and what your view of the world is and really stick to that. Well, I think that's a great advice, even for someone who can't sing like, <laughs> like yours truly here. <laughs> Delightful to talk to Barbara J. Simon. I wish you many, many more students, much, many sales of this really good book, and, uh, and the joy, continued joy in vocalizing. Thank you so much. Shalom to you. Bye-bye.